proceed to present uh, Ilya. So uh, good morning to everyone. So it's a it's a pleasure for me to introduce uh, Patricia Henobuhe from the University of uh, uh, Côte d'Azur. Uh, as you'll see, she has uh, many uh, different uh, research interests, uh, including uh, analysis of spike trains, functional connectivity, adaptivity, adaptivity, adaptivity statistics, and so on. Among many other things, I think she has a very important uh, role in building uh, the Neuromod Institute in the Université Côte d'Azur which is very similar somehow to Neuromat Institute. Um, and uh, so she, for example, she received some, 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 some very important uh, uh, <laughs> awards, including, for example, the CNRS uh, Silver Medal in Mathematics. So I think it um, will be great for all of us to have her uh, speaking for during the week. So uh, without further ado, so Patricia. Thank you. Thanks a lot, uh, Guilherme. Um, so it's really a pleasure for me to be here at this uh, Brazilian school in honor of you. Um, so Antonio has done uh, a great work in mathematical neuroscience and mathemati mathematicians have not been always interested in neuroscience and it's quite recently that people started this mathematical neuroscience stuff and Antonio did a lot of stuff around probability and you will have the fantastic course of Eva about uh, probability and neuroscience. And uh, when he invited me uh, in Sao Paulo in 2017, we were trying to build something which looked like Neuromat, and Neuromat inspired me a lot to build Neuromod, which is our institute of modeling in neuroscience and cognition. And uh, Antonio did a great job in probability, but also in statistics. And my course will be more on the statistical part and how statistics uh, theoretical statistics can be linked to neuroscience. And of course, statistics, they have a, um, a big uh, place to take in mathematical neuroscience because this is a way to match the data to the mo mathematical models that we have. Uh, so what I'm going to speak about is biological neural networks. I want to stress that they are biological because people, when I'm usually talking about neural networks, they think artificial neural networks because it's a lot of stuff around deep learning. I'm not going to speak about that. I'm going to speak really of what's inside your brain. And also, I made um, a small switch uh, because we talked with Epeva. At the beginning, it was announced that I was going to speak, uh, speak about simulation, coding ability, and connectivity. Uh, but in fact, Eva is going to speak about the simulation part. And so I decided to add uh, something new, which is how we handle learning data. And it's only at the end, it will be the last course. Um, also, yeah, what I wanted to say is that at Neuromod, we developed a, a package, let's say, uh, to reconstruct functional connectivity and also to simulate spike trains. And uh, we, for the ones who want, if you agree, install it on your laptop. The session will be this afternoon at 2.30. There will be our engineer of Neuromod online in the exercise of the last day. So it will be on Thursday, where Sophie will be. <laughs> She's also going to give us some math exercise uh, during all the week. But on the last day uh, with me, she will handle how we use this, uh, this package and how, what are the algorithms behind. She will do a lot, uh, a bit of Calico decomposition algorithm as we talk with our engineer this afternoon. And there is also uh, a big file where you have everything that you need to install it. Uh, I will recall it this afternoon. Okay. Uh, so since I'm starting, I think that's the plan for the six hours. Uh, so first, I'm going to give you uh, the, neuro, ah, the neuroscience background, let's say, uh, because I don't think all of you know what, what's going on exactly. So uh, it's um, a, a very short uh, resume of what you need to know for what's going on in the course and a reference experiment that will guide me through all the course that a um, biologist uh, did and you will understand the, the experiment and then you will see all the mathematical questions can, that can be answered or asked depending on what you think uh, uh, about the neuroscience uh, framework and they are mathematical questions. Then today I will mainly speak about high rate coding neurons 
Uh, and uh, I, I put that for Antonio. Uh, it's another way to look at the statistician brain, uh, different from what he did. Uh, but I hope it will interest you as well to see another point of view on this statistician brain. And then tomorrow, uh, I will finish that because it's quite long and it's also a work that I did with Guilherme Ost. Speak about synchronization. Um, on Thursday, I think I will speak about Hox processes and on Friday uh, about the learning data. Okay, so let's start with the neurobiological background. So in your brain, uh, you have neurons. I hope everyone knows the neurons. It looks like that. So you have a, a cell. This is the body. And then you have what they are called dendrites. And that's where the neurons is receiving information. And they are received by the dendrites of the postsynaptic neurons. And it will excite the neurons. So if you want a kind of schematic view of what's going on, uh, when um, the chemicals are arriving here, they are making, this is the voltage of the cell uh, uh, with a frequency which is quite high. You see that the neuron is going to be excited, excited, and excited. And at one point, it cannot resist. It has to emit this action potential that is going to travel around the axon and then pass to the other synaptic stuff. OK? So if you have this uh, action potential that is going on. OK? This action potential, uh, it has a very prescribed shape. It depends on the nature of the neuron. So there is not much information in it from a mathematical point of view because it's due to the chemical property of the neuron. So which means that the only information, well, the main information that a neuron is going to pass to the postsynaptic neuron is in fact a zero one information. Is there an action potential or is there not an action potential? So that's the main, the first main feature we are going to look at. And for the course today, what you have to for, uh, remind is it's a zero one phenomenon. But there are other steps that you need to do for, to know for what's going on afterwards. So the, the other thing is that you have the synaptic integration because those neurons, the voltage, and somehow you can imagine that this is a kind of summation phenomenon that is going on here. And this is called the synaptic integration. Okay, so the way they are communicated, if you think of them as a network, which we will not do today, but in the rest of the course we will do, is that you have this synaptic integration that is making the neurons dependent on each other in the network. The last thing you have to know, because sometimes it's important, and I think it might be important, especially for Eva, is that when you have this action potential, you see you are going back, but really, really below the resting potential. So there is a small delay during which the, the neuron is too tired to fire again. And uh, this delay that we will not model in my course is called the refractory period, meaning that two spikes cannot be too close together okay, for a given neuron. And then I have to give you an idea of our brain. And uh, it's already 10 to the power 6 neurons, so it's big. And the smaller unit you can think of that you can like anatomically extract from the brain is the cortical barrel. And the cortical barrel is, um, let's say, a small unit which is linked to your perception, for instance, uh, for the rat. You will see a, um, a picture after that. And it's already 10 to the power 4. So meaning that the number of neurons that are involved even in homogeneous network, it's already super big. Um, this can legitimate, in some sense, everything that you will see with Eva's course uh, about mean field approximation, because this number is huge, even in small parts that are kind of homogeneous. Okay, and yeah, what I forgot to say is that you can interrupt me, and please interrupt, and I don't realize it, so please stop me, uh, either on the neuroscience part or the math part, okay? Okay, so. The, the network is huge, the number of neurons is huge, but what you see from the statistical point of view, it's okay. So here, here you will see the, the a cortical barrel. So here, for instance, you have the head of the rat and you have whiskers, okay? And those whiskers, really for a, a rat, it's super important because that's the way it feels in the environment, in the dark, you know, in the sewer or whatever. So in fact, there is a link between each whisker and the part of the brain. And, and this part of the brain, this is a cortical barrel, which I told you is 10 to the power 4 neurons. So one whisker is linked in the cortex to 10 to the power 4 neurons already. 
okay? And basically, when you uh, move this whisker, you're going to have activity in the corresponding cortical barrel. And then what neuroscientists do is that you put electrodes inside your brain, in the, the cortical barrel here, and you have to imagine that you are in this situation where you are almost like in a submarine. You have your electrode, which is deep inside uh, the network, but the animal is alive, so you don't know exactly where it is. So you know it's inside the cortical barrel, for instance, because you record the activity that corresponds to the stimulus, but that's basically it. So you're blind, you have your electrodes, which is here, and this electrode is going to record some stuff, some electrical activity around. And so the road signal, it looks like that, and you can filter it with bus, uh, low pass filter and uh, up pass filter. And basically what you would get is either the global activity of say thousands of neurons nearby. This is called the local field potential. It's really a smooth uh, signal like that, which is the global electrical activity of the thousands of neurons that are around the electrode. And then you can also isolate the ones that are the closer to you with the, the other filter. And you will see here, the peak, they are the spikes of the neurons. And because somehow the shape of the action potential is really unique to a given neuron, you can assign uh, to a given neuron the time at which they have emitted a spike. A spike action potential for me is the same. Just maybe let's write it before it gets confusing. For me, a spike, it's the same thing as an action potential. And for me, it will be just a zero one phenomenon. Okay. okay, so you record that. You look only at this part for what I will need in this course. No, it depends, in fact, on how far they are from the electrode, which is also an hint uh, on how to clusterize the, the spikes. In fact, I said one electrode, usually you have four electrodes and you kind of triangulate with respect to the size where a little bit where at which distance the neurons are and, and you are extracting these as well to clusterize the shapes. Uh, but here, yeah, well, you see those, the small one could be seen also as a spike, but a more distant spike, more distant neurons. So basically, what you will get at the end, and the data, they will always look either like that or like that, but they are the same representation. It's here you have time. Here you have the number of new neurons. I think, for instance, here it's the size of the action potential. So you see here that depending on the neuron, we don't always have the same size. And the tick here, they, they are the mark at the time at which, the, for instance, the green neuron has spiked, okay, or the, or the red neuron has spiked. Uh, same representation here, except I put dots at the time at which a spike has been emitted. And so when you look at that, you realize that those spikes, they are forming a point process in time. Okay, so that's, that's going to be our main model for Eva and me. What we want is that to model this series of instants in time. Phenomenon, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Okay, uh, and then so there is um, a task uh, that we will follow through all the course, uh, which has been recorded uh, in Marseille on rats. And so the, those rats, they were put in, in this maze. Okay, this is a um, continuous tea maze. It's, uh, that's the name of it. And at the same time that the rat is moving in this maze, uh, they have recorded the activity in special part of the brain. Okay? Okay, so what the rat has to learn uh, throughout the experiment is to do this Z shape. So if you put it here, uh, well, for instance, it starts from here. What it has to do is to do this path, this complex path to get reward here. If it doesn't do this path, it doesn't get any reward. And if he wants the reward on the other side, it will have to do this symmetric Z path. Okay? So if it's completely a free learning experiment, meaning the rat is there for 20 minutes and he has to guess it or not, and it will be there for many days, up to 50 days. Okay? So 
every day he will have this 20 minute session where he is put in the in the maze and at the end we hope that he is going to understand really what are the paths that are the good ones and so at the end if everything goes as planned he's going to do those eight shapes super fast because he will re get reward at each step okay um and so what you get out of that uh we kind of try to understand what was the behavior of the rats in the maze. Uh, first of all, the maze is very narrow, which means that the rat is not likely to make Q-turn. It's very difficult for him to make Q-turn. So the only part where he can somehow turn are at the feeder or at the crossroads, but in the middle of a straight line, he's not able to, to, to make a reverse turn. Okay? So if you think about it, there are not that many paths that he can do. In fact, there are 12. So you have the good path, the one that will give them reward, like that, okay? But he can also go straight from one to another. He can do them in the reverse way. So instead, uh, sorry, instead of doing like this, he's going to go down like this. Uh, no, I'm doing it. He's going to do that, okay? So that's the reverse path. The good path is you go diagonally, then vertical, then straight. And the reverse path is you go straight, then vertically, and then the reverse. Okay. Of course, you can do the V-shape and you can do loops. Okay, go back to the same feeder if you want. And here you have the number of paths uh, that is going to do per minute, and you see that it kind of it's really really fast. At the end, it's making about three paths per minute, so it's going to be super fast and making those eight, as I told you. And really, in the end, around 60 days, you see all the other paths have disappeared. So really learned to make the eight, as I told you. But at the beginning, it's not that clear. At the beginning, he can try to do the good path, but also the straight, because of course, he knows that there is food here and here. So he's going to check if I'm getting food in the more rapid way that he can think of, which is the straight path. And then progressively, the straight path will diminish. At one point, it will still start to do some straight path. And really, in the last phase of, uh, of the experiment, is going to do mainly the, the eight inside the, the maze, okay? <coughs> Last bit of neuroscience information that you need to know is that they are going to measure two different parts of the brain in the three atom. So there is dorsal median and dorsal lateral. What they know is that if you remove those parts of the brain for the rats, that depending on which part you remove, there are behaviors that it cannot have anymore. So for instance, if you remove the dorsal median triatom, he's not interested by food anymore. He has not goal-directed behavior. So he cannot learn at all. Okay? If you remove the dorsal lateral triatom, you remove the habit part. Habit means, for instance, when you have learned to run a bicycle, at one point it becomes completely automatic. You don't think about it, it's not conscious, but if you are put on a bicycle, you are going to run it. Of course, it's not First, you have to learn it. So at the beginning, it's not that automatic. This is where you need this part of your brain somehow. And at one point, it will become automatic. And this is where this part is taking charge of the memory that you are forming to how to ma maneuver a bicycle. Okay? And so typically, the habit part is what is going on here. At this point, the rat is making eight in the maze all the time. And, and that's an habit that he has taken um, and he's not taking anything else as a choice. Okay, that's the end of the neuroscience part. Uh, so now let's talk about firing rate coding neurons. Um, uh, so we are here, okay, and I will not finish today. I hope to have at least the two first points today. Uh, uh, and yes, that's also all the people I've been working with. So the first line, those are the uh, biologists who have recorded the experiment I told you about in the maze. Sophie is my PhD student and is a mathematician. Those two are uh, neuroscientists. And Guilherme is for the most theoretical part about what do you mean by coding for the brain. And of course, it is a rat, because we need to, to acknowledge that the, there were rats. And his name is Robert, by the way. Um, 
So before starting really the math point of view, I want you to understand what is meant by coding for the neuroscientist. In fact, when neuroscience and cognition started, it was just after the war, um, they developed at the same time that computers were developing. And there has been a lot of exchange between people doing computer science and people doing cognition. And people doing cognition, they thought somehow that the brain was a computer. And that if they cracked the code in which it was programmed, you would understand how the brain was working, right? Uh, of course, this metaphor is a bit weird because in a computer, there is a user which is outside of the computer, which is understanding the code and decoding it somehow. Here, your brain is doing it by themselves, so it's, the brain is at the same time the computer and the user of the computer, so it's a bit a weird metaphor, but still, it explains a lot why neuroscientists wanted to crack this code. And now, what they mean by coding is that at least if you think there is a code in your brain, it means that between two conditions, your state of the brain should be different. Okay? So if there is a coding, it means that the brain is going to be different between two conditions, and that's what we want to look for. Do we have statistical evidence that there is two different states, and that the state is associated to a certain condition? I will explain a bit more just after. And then the first thing we are going to do is to try to detect those firing rate coding neurons uh, by statistical tests. Okay, so that's the first part of today. Um, I, I start, I didn't know exactly the level, so you will tell me if it's too obvious for you or not. Okay, please uh, tell me. Yes. I will explain. Here, for instance, it will be the firing rate because when I'm speaking about firing, the firing rate of a given neuron, so far, it could be EEG, LFP, and so on, but I'm not going to speak about that. It could be the state of the network, and we will speak about that later. But for the moment, and for today, it will just be the frequency at which the spikes are emitted. Okay, so is there a difference in this frequency? Okay, uh, so, uh, is it, where? If I well, right here, it's okay, or it's too far? It's too far here, it's fine? Okay. Um, so let's start with Poisson processes, because I, everyone knows what is a Poisson process or not? Yeah, so far, so good. So for me, just to fix the notation, n uh, is a random set of points. which is countable, and that's going to be my point process. And n is Poisson on uh, Cx, which is a subpart of Rd. And I'm doing it on Rd just to fix notation because I think Eva might need it. No, not really? OK. So any case, wait, you have, uh, if you have a1 and n that are a distinct uh, subset of Rd, then n a1 until n a n are independent. And this thing is the number of points in a1. Okay, that's how I, I denote that. And you have also that n a obeys a Poisson distribution with parameters the integral over a of lambda of x dx, and lambda is called the intensity. It's, it's OK, or? No, they, they tell me it's fine. Uh. And uh, what I need after that is that usually I'm going to write them on r plus. And in this sense, lambda of x is a kind of firing rate. OK, for, uh, if I imagine that my points are the spikes, lambda of x will give me my instantaneous frequency of spiking. Uh, if lambda is constant, and that's what I will assume today, uh, we are speaking about homogeneous Poisson process. And uh, what do I need more? 
Oh, yes. And uh, there is a last notation that I need, which is this is a point measure. So if n is a set of points, t1, tn, etc., then dnt is the sum of the direct mass over i, which means that if I'm integrating f of t with respect to dn of t, I'm just summing df of ti over i. OK? So, so far, I think for all of you, this is OK. OK, uh, now we are going to test if a neuron is coding, OK, by just observing the spike trains in different conditions. Uh, test is OK for everybody, or statistical test? Yes? OK. So. OK, so imagine you observe n1 until nk. Those are spike trains. Uh, of a given neuron in different, in k, different condition. So for instance, you can imagine that so condition one is uh, every time uh, the rat has done this path. And that condition two, I don't know, it's each time the rat has done this path, for instance, etc. And for all the 12 paths. Uh, of course, you see with this experiment that um, you are not observing them on the same time, because it might take more time to do that than to do that. Okay? And also, you are going to regroup everything that looks the same. Like, for instance, if you're doing 12 times this path, you're going to glue them together. So what is important is that you have T1, yeah, bad choice of name, um, D1, until dk, that are the duration of observation for um, the k spike trains. And what you want to test is h0. So yes, I forgot. Last thing, lambda 1 until lambda k, they are the firing rates, and they are thought homogeneous. Okay. Uh, in the k condition. So, as I told you, if my neuron is firing rate coding, it means that there should be a change in its firing rate depending on the condition. Right? Yeah. I think some of the spikes are independent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They are going to be Poisson. And uh, we are assuming that n1 up to nk, sorry, n1 up to nk are independent. Which is a strong assumption, I agree with you. Uh, but for the moment, we start small, so Poisson process, everything is independent. OK? OK. Uh, so what we want to test, in fact, to detect that uh, a neuron is coding, is that we want to test that lambda 1 is equal to lambda k versus there exists i such that lambda i is different from the other lambda k. OK? And if we reject the assumption, we are going to have a coding neuron. OK? No, no, no. I will explain. In fact, uh, this is an exercise of this afternoon uh, exercise session in the case k equal 2. And what we could prove is that uh, given, uh, so we superpose it in this way. Given n1 uh, d1 until nk dk 
I sum them. So like given the total number of spikes that I have seen equal little n, one can prove that under H0, uh, n1 d1 until nk dk is a multinomial with parameter, so this is n, and here you have to give the vector of probability, and the vector of probability pk is just the duration dk divided by d1 plus etc plus dk. So under H0, it means basically that um, you can group all the spikes together, and then the probability that one spike is appearing in condition k just depends on the duration of observation that you have seen. If it's super small, then you, it's not likely, and if it's super big, it's very likely. Mm -hmm. How does this compare with trying to do confidence intervals from standards? It's much more easy. Because here, you just want, you, you can detect more somehow. In particular, if you reject, well, we will see it's just a chi-square test. But if you reject, you know that there is one which is different from the other because it means that the probability p is not just proportional to the duration, but you don't know which one. And in this sense, it can see much more deviation from uh, being equal than if you we are testing each independent, uh, each independent rate individually. But you cannot pinpoint which is the condition that is different. OK? So what we are going to do is a chi-square test, uh, which means that you are looking at the distribution of z, which is the sum for k equal 1 to be k of n 1 dk minus n pk to the square divided by n p k. And you know that this thing is converging in distribution when little n tends to infinity for a chi-square test, chi-square distribution with k minus 1 degrees of freedom. So far, I think it's fine because we are just testing that this is a multinomial. And so it means that your test looks like that. So it means that your test is going to say, OK, let q1 minus alpha be the 1 minus alpha quantile of uh, this distribution. Uh, I reject h0 if dead is bigger than q1 minus alpha, uh, which implies that the test is asymptotically of level alpha. OK, um, everybody knows p-value? Yeah? What? Yeah, OK. So you know that the p-value is a value at which uh, it's going to pass from acceptation to rejection. So in our case, it will be f of z, because you have that z bigger than q1 minus alpha is equivalent to uh, f of z is, b is smaller than alpha, where f is a CDF this thing, right? OK. Uh, more generally, so you can prove that for all alpha, the probability is that under H0, that f of z is smaller than alpha. Well, in this case, it will tend to alpha. In the more general way, this is your definition in a, of a p-value. If you are able to, to have <coughs> Uh, quantities that depends only on your data, such as this hold, you can use it at a p-value, and you can just say that your test is the fact that the p-value is smaller than alpha, and you're good. Also, what it means, this thing, and it's important for the SQL, it means that under H0, the p-value is uniform, or is lower than, in the more general case, a uniform. Or, oh, well, depends if you are speaking about the variable. The variable is bigger than the uniform, which means that the CDF is smaller than the one. 
OK. OK, so I know how to detect that one neuron is coding, right? Ha, huh, good question. My problem, well, usually you will take 5%. But my big problem is that I have, in my experiment, 600 neurons. So we are not going to do that for every neuron at level alpha, because if we do that, we are going to have a lot of mistakes, right? You, or everyone knows this multiple testing problem, yes? OK, so because of that, you have a multiple testing problem. So there is two ways to fight against that. So either you can do Bonferroni, which means that if you want to control the probability that there exists an i for which a0 is true and we reject it, which means it's a false detection or a false discovery, you are saying, OK, this is smaller than the sum than the priority under h0 that my p-value for neuron i is smaller than C alpha, which means that this is smaller than my K times alpha. So if I want this to be smaller than 5%, it means that my alpha has to be 0 0.05 divided by K, right? Uh, yeah, sorry. Right. So this is my M. Thank you. <laughs> this is my M and this is M. OK? And of course, if you do that with 600, you are not going to discover any coding neurons because it's too small. Okay. So there is another method, which is called Benjamini Hirschberg. Um. So Benjamini Hirschberg as well, it's fine for everybody or? No, no, okay. <laughs> so. So Benjamin Hirschberg, it's another method which is not controlling the same quantity. What Benjamin Hirschberg is controlling is the false discovery rate. And this is what? This is the expectation of the number of false discoveries over the total number of discoveries. OK? And what I mean by a discovery, it's uh, an I for which I reject H0. So if there is nothing to see, OK, if all the I's are under H0, it means that a discovery can only be a false discovery, OK? A discovery is a false discovery. So in this case, the number of false discovery divided by the number of discovery is just the indicator that there exists an i such that h0 is rejected. So in this case, the false discovery rate and the probabilities that I computed for Bonferroni are the same. But if this is not the case, you can have a look at that. This thing is going to be smaller than 1. So in fact, you have, so this is my FDR. My FDR, in general, FDR is always smaller than the probability that there exists an i such so that h0 is true and rejected. OK? So it means that when I'm not in the case where there is nothing to discover, but there are a few things to discover in, in my big set of neurons, then if I'm controlling the FDR by 5%, I can have that which is much bigger than 5%. OK? So Benjamin Hirschberg is controlling this and not this thing. Uh, and 
And the way it's done, it's as follows. So uh, the method is, so you are going to rank your p-values. Okay, so this is the p-value ranked. So P1 is the smallest one, and you go up until Pm, which is the number of neurons that you have. And you are going to look at K hat, which is, I don't want to mess up the formula to be sure. Uh, so it will be um, the maximum of the K, such that Pk, so the K smallest p-value, is smaller than k over m times alpha. Yeah, maybe I should, yeah, okay, with k. k is not my condition anymore, it's uh, neurons, right? Maybe I should write i, just to be sure you're not confusing them. Uh, which means, say differently, that if here you have the rank from 1 to m, and here you put the P, P1, the smallest one, P2, etc., until Pm, okay? This one is the biggest one. Of course, my curve is, uh, can do something like that, okay? If you think about it, uh, what is doing Bonferroni? Bonferroni is saying, um, there is no color, right? Oh, yes, there is color here. Um, Bonferroni is saying, okay, I have my level, which is alpha divided by m, and I put a straight line like that. And all the p-values that are smaller than that, I'm going to reject them. Okay, so that's Bonferroni uh, curve. And uh, Benjamin Yoshberg curve is like that. You are going to go from there to alpha. Okay, so it's in between alpha over m and alpha. You take this straight line. This is the i over m times alpha. And, uh, and you're going to, so I should have done something even more interesting like that. So it's not everything that is below the curve. It's the maximum that is below the curve. So my i hat is here. Okay. And I'm rejecting all the p-values until there, so I'm rejecting much more p-values than what I'm rejecting with Ponferroni. Potentially, if all my p-values are smaller than alpha, I can reject all of them, because the last one will be smaller than alpha, and then if all my p-values are smaller than alpha, then I can do the stupid thing, which is rejecting everything that is under alpha. And so for this thing, so you reject all the i, such that the p-value i is smaller than this one. And then the fdr is smaller than alpha. Um, what is nice with benjamin Hirschberg method, uh, if you look at uh, the way it has been cited in the literature, it's one of the most cited paper. It's, uh, in fact, a very exponentially increasing uh, cited method. Why? It's because at the beginning, it was the only way to look uh, for genetics in thousands of genes. Because if you divide by thousand, there is no way you can do that. So now all the genetics paper are forcing people to use Benjamin Hirschberg to avoid problem of reproducibility of research, etc., etc. So it's one of the most cited methods in statistics because of that. And so that's what we did here. So we applied it on the 600 neurons, OK? And now it means that we have access, up to the fact that we control the false discovery rate, uh, to the coding neurons that have been recorded in my experiment. OK? OK. So once I have that, I will stop bothering you with uh, too much statistics. Uh, so what I'm going to do now is just to explain what we found with just this very basic analysis. Uh, so now forget about how I 
arrive there, I have a neuron I. So for each neuron I, I have what? I have yi, which is uh, 0, 1, which is, is it coding or not? I have another variable, xi, which is, do I belong to the dorsomedial striatum or to the dorsolateral striatum? I have a variable stage, which is the stage of learning that I have. And there is another variable, fsi, which is, uh, let's call it zi, which is a type of neuron, if you want. But this thing, we didn't find anything particular, so, except in this small thing. So let's forget about that. Um, and let's just focus on one particular path. So here, the rat is doing either this path or this path. OK? It's not a complete path. And what we are looking at is the firing rate between A and B. So if you look at the rat in the maze, it's at the exact same position, so it's not like um, the spatial condition on which the rat is, is different, okay? The only thing that distinguish this AB from this EB is that in the future, it's going to turn left or right. And the question is, is the rat aware? Meaning, is the brain coding for the next turn that the rat is going to know, to do? So, is the rat aware of his next action, whereas physically, it is at exactly the same place? Okay, so here you have just two conditions. The, the only change is what's going on in the future, and you are detecting coding neurons. And so the first thing you see, so this is this part, the first thing you see is that there is more coding neurons in the DMS than in the DLS, meaning that there is a difference of coding depending on the region in your brain. Well, first there is a, a coding. First thing, there are neurons that are coding for that. Next, and in fact, there is a lot. Like on the 600 we had, there is 100 that are coding in the DMS and 42 in the DLS. There are more coding neurons in the DMS. And also what is super fun is that the number of neurons in the DLS is going to increase with the stage, which is coherent with the fact that at the end of the learning, it's an habit. So it should be coded inside the DLS. And there are more, more coding neurons in the DLS at the end of the experiment, whereas it's decreasing for the DMS. So the DMS was there to learn, and somehow they disappear. OK? So from a neuroscience point of view, with this very simple statistical analysis, you can already see a lot, which is the difference between DMS and DLS, and even the dynamic during learning of those two populations. And we are just speaking about firing rate coding neurons. So far, you with me? Yes? Yeah. It's, a, it's an ANOVA, but uh, stage one, two, three, it's not a slope, it's uh, the coefficient. So it's like uh, qualitative uh, variables. It's really a stage, so it belongs to one, two, three, four. So that's why I have a coefficient per, uh, per stage. And my reference was uh, DLS, stage one, and I don't remember for FSI. I think it was the other one, but OK. So you see, here, the coefficient is bigger for DLS, because that's my reference, than for DMS, right? And OK, here, somehow, it compensates back for DMS. But if you look at like the full path, you see it's really negative for DMS. So it, it kind of decrease for the part of the brain which is there to make you learn. I'm oversimplifying my neuroscientific background, okay? The neuroscientist will never say it like that. But to oversimplify it, somehow the part that is there to make you learn is going to disengage, so there is less necessity to have coding neurons. Whereas the part that is there to make it an habit, you have to code it in the part where you have the habit. And so the, there is more and more coding neurons there. Okay? Okay. Uh, I just want to show you other uh, firing rate coding neurons because the one that I've given you for the path is not the most obvious one. In the literature, it started especially with this experiment for Georgopoulos, and you will see that 
it's not just going far for anticipation, it's going a lot, it's coding a lot and a lot of stuff. So here in the experiment, you have a monkey that is going to uh, have a target on the screen, and depending on the target, he has to push the lever in this direction. Okay? And the time at which he's pressing the lever is the zero in all those experiments. So for instance, if I have to put it like that, here is my zero, and you see that the... So here it's several trials of the same neurons, and you see there is no change in firing rate when I'm doing it like that. Okay? Whereas when I'm doing in this direction or this direction, there is something very strange that is happening, which is, for instance, if I'm doing like this, I have less firing before even the action, so I'm anticipating the action, I have less firing, I press the lever, I continue to be kind of inhibited here, and then I go back to normal. Whereas in the other direction, I'm going to, to increase the firing rate before the action, then having the action, and then it continues to be that big, and then it vanishes again. Yes? How do you possibly expand activity in the monkey? Uh, they put uh, electrodes in the brain. As I told you for uh, the rats, it's the same idea. It, it's in the but it's very small. Uh, if you look at them, they are as thin as uh, hair. So it's super small, and uh, yeah, they are opening the, the skull and putting it in, in it. That's a device. Yeah, uh, so I haven't seen it for monkey, I have seen it for rats, but at the end they have a kind of hat that is glued to their head. Uh, except of that, they are behaving like normal animals and uh, running and uh, cleaning themselves. And when they want to record, they plug it. So they, they put a, they like a USB, uh, kind of USB, they plug it in, in the hat and they record the activity during the experiment and then they remove it. But the hat is there uh, for the life of, of the animal. Yes? Sorry. Yeah. What? what so, here he has a screen, and for instance, the screen is asking him to uh, put the lever in this direction. So, he's manipulating the lever and he's going in this direction. Okay? And this is the direction of uh, what he has done, not the direction of what was asked. But, well, of course. Because he's receiving a drop of juice, this time he has the correct direction. At one point, he's doing no mistakes. Yes? So far, so good? So you see that here, the uh, neuron is firing rate coding for the direction of movement. OK? There is another code. Uh, well, two other code. Um, in 1971, O'Keefe discovered, and Dostrovsky, uh, they discovered place cells. So play cells, uh, they are cells that are firing, and here uh, they put a dot, not in time, but in space. Okay, so for instance, here I have the pink neuron, and each time it has spike, I place it at the mark where the rat is in the maze. So you see that the pink neuron is firing when the rat is here, the green neuron is firing when the rat is here, etc., etc. So it's as for the direction of movement, there is a favorite place where the neuron is going to discharge more than other. Okay? Um, just for the record, those place cells they are in your hippocampus. So a long time ago, before Waze and so on, uh, they measured hippocampus in taxi drivers in London, and their hippocampus was huge because they have to remember all the places in London, which is kind of big, so they have much more place cells, so much more coding neurons than usual because they have to code it a lot of different places. Okay, uh, what I still don't get is that O'Keefe was a genius and with that he thought there is another way to code position. And in fact, they have to wait for uh, 2005. The Mothers, uh, they were spouses, uh, discovered another system in a different part of the brain, which is a grid cell. And the grid cell is super fun, because here again, so in black, you have the path of the rat in a square maze here. And in red, you put a dot each, each time, a given neuron, it's just one neuron, okay? No, not several neurons, just one neuron. You put a dot each time this neuron is firing. And you see that 
uh, associated to this neuron, there is a kind of grid, which is a triangular grid. And each time the rat is close to a uh, vertex of this grid, the neuron is going to fire. Okay? So it's not a favorite place, it's a favorite grid okay, that the, these grid cells have. And what is also fun is that depending on the cell, you have different scale for the grid. So this is, another, this is the same maze, but another scale. So you see the, the mesh is much bigger for this one. And eventually, you go to a point where you have just one guy, which basically looks like a play cell, like, because the maze is small, you have just one vertex of the grid, and then it looks like if it prefers this central position. Okay? So those are grid cells. Uh, and for those discovery of the um, place system in the, in the rat, they all won the Nobel Prize in, in 2014. Okay, one last stuff that you need to know about grid cell because we will use it is that they are organized in module, uh, which means that the size of the mesh is discrete. Okay, so if you look at all the cells, the size of the mesh, there are people, there are, uh, this is the orientation of the grid, so it's also discrete, but the size of the mesh is discrete. And this is called modules. Okay, and so, so far, we have played as a statistician, which is the experimenter, and which is trying to find what are the conic neurons. Now let's play the reverse. We are the brain. The information that we get out of the environment are just the spike trains. What can we do with that? As a statistician, but now the statistician is the brain, not the experimenter. So I, I will do it on the blackboard because maybe it's easier to understand if I do it at the same time. Um, so now you have imagined, so this is a physical world. And uh, for the moment, imagine it's a line to simplify. Okay. And the rat is here. This is its position. That's the rat position. But of course, the brain doesn't know that. Yeah, for the moment, it will stay there. It's an open problem to do it when it moves. For the moment, the rat will just stay at position S for a given time. And the thing is that the brain is not seeing that. It does not see itself by itself. Okay, so what it sees, it's for instance, if you are thinking there is a place cell system, you have here the place preferred by neuron one. So if you look at neuron one now in time, it's doing something like that. So here, zero, it's the position at which uh, the rat starts to be at position S. Before, there is a small noise, so there are spikes. But because when it arrives here, it is at position S, and S is the place preferred by the neuron, it starts to spike more, OK? And so, of course, if your T is super small, you're not too going to detect it instantly. Because those are just spikes, right? So if T is there before even the first spike, there is no way you know that you are at position S. You have to wait for time T, well, to have like statistical evidence of this is different from that, meaning that I'm in this place preferred by neuron one, so I know where I am. Uh, up to, of course, the size of the place preferred by neuron one. Now, it's just for one neuron. If I have a second neuron, uh, if I have a second neuron, then maybe my second neuron, this is my place preferred by N2, and N2 is going to be that. So same thing, it starts very slow. And then it starts to be big again. And you can imagine that because you have now two neurons, maybe you are realizing faster that there is a change first. And because you have two neurons, you have a more precise localization of your rat because you know you're here. Okay? 
So when you increase the number of neurons, you're going to go, well, you hope, you're going to go faster and to have more precision on your localization. Okay? Okay, so that's what I, same thing. If you do this with grid cell, it's the same idea, except that now, okay, maybe this one is in the big module, which looks like a play cell, so you have the same thing for neuron one. And then for neuron two, you have something which is periodic. Okay, it's a line, so periodic here is not a grid, it's just something like that. But it's the same idea. Even if it's periodic like that, if you have just neuron two to help you, then you don't know if you are there or there. But you, if you have both, you still get a better precision with less time. Right? So qualitatively, you have the same idea. The more neurons you have, the more precise is your localization with less time. OK. So what people did is to try to understand what the brain was doing exactly, or no, not what the brain was doing, but it's kind of a philosophical experiment of what the brain could do by just observing that. And so what they said, OK, you have a stimulus or a position F, so this thing, and you're going to have a rate Fi of S, which is going to, so it can be something continuous, or it could be something very discrete, like, sorry, very discrete like that, OK? It's my function Fi of S that is going to give me the firing rate as a function of the stimulus S, or the position S. And what you are going to assume is that you have independence between the cells, as before. Except that now the problem is not to recover what are the cells that are coding, it's they are, these N cells are coding. How good is your precision on estimating S? OK. Um, so uh, one of the things you have learned, I think, uh, in statistics is the kramer rau bond. Yeah, maybe I have to explain again what it is. Yeah, yes. OK. Uh, so kramer rau bond. Um, so kramer rau bond is a, a very general thing, and you will prove it again in this special case in, in in the afternoon, uh, is going to say um, if you have a uh, theta, which is, I don't know, uh, which belongs to big theta, which is a subset of R. For the moment, I will do it in R to simplify, but the proof exists in RD, OK, it's the same. And you have theta hat, which is an estimator of theta. And what you assume is that it's unbiased. So it means that for all theta, the expectation when the parameter is theta of theta hat is equal to b theta. OK? So it's a very special kind of estimator. It has to be unbiased. And then what it says, it says that the variance, so kramer rau bond, tells you that the variance of theta hat, which is in fact the expectation under theta of the distance between theta hat and theta, because this is its expectation, right? The square is always bigger than 1 over the Fisher information. And you will compute it this afternoon. It's a, comp it's a quantity that be depends on the likelihood, the derivative of the likelihood. I don't want to bother you with that. For the ones who are interested, we will do the computation this afternoon. OK, uh, so what does it say? Uh, it says first that whatever <coughs> the unbiased estimator that you can have, you cannot beat this lower bound. And in fact, you can also prove in a lot of scenarios that the maximum likelihood estimator is what we call deficient which means that asymptotically, it reaches kramer rau bond. Asymptotically. 
Okay. The, uh, the maximum likelihood is not unbiased. That's why it reaches only asymptotically. And you have assumption around that. It's like uh, exponential family. You have a lot of derivatives to exist, etc., etc., to be continuous, etc., etc. But the main uh, message of it was that okay, with that, it means like the best estimator is going to be the maximum likelihood estimator. And if I'm using that, then I know that I have the best bond ever, which is one over the Fisher information. Okay. So we don't know what the brain is doing, but if is the best thing you can think of, people thought, okay, then it's going to be that. Okay, then it's going to use a maximum likelihood estimator. I told you it's a metaphor that the brain is the user of the computer, which is the brain at the same time. There is a lot of philosophy around that, but that's what they thought. And so it means that the best code ever, if we are thinking what is the best code that evolution can give us, would be the one with the smallest Fisher information. No, sorry, the biggest Fisher information, meaning the smallest bond. OK? Meaning the smallest error. OK. Uh, so that's what Brunel and Landal did. And they have shown that when you are using a system which looks like the place cell system, uh, the Fisher information is of order n. You will prove it this afternoon with Sophie. And so it means that if you are looking at, um, at the best error you can do in average, so the best error will be like the square root of uh, sorry, under the position f of s hat minus s to the square, so that would be like the standard deviation uh, of your estimator, you know that this thing will be, that in this case, like 1 over square root of n. Okay? Because your Fisher information, which is a square, is in 1 over n. Okay. People have shown that for grid cell, so it's much more recent, of course it's after the discovery of grid cells, but they have shown that the Fisher information for grid cell is exponentially increasing with n. Meaning that the precision that you are going to have, so this is for place cell, and for grid cells, you get something which is like exponential minus a constant n. Okay? So it's much, much smaller. So the precision you would have with grid cell would be better than place cell. Maybe that's a reason why this grid cell system exists. But uh, with uh, Guilherme, we wanted to know then if there is a better system than place cell, which is a grid cell, why do we have the place cell? Right? There, there should be an explanation around that. Also, there is something that I don't like with Kramer Howe interpretation, is that um, it assumes that the brain is making an unbiased estimator. And it's not clear that an unbiased estimator is the best thing you can do. In fact, there is a phenomenon called Stein, which is telling you that if you are looking at unbiased estimator, there exist unbiased, no, sorry, there exist biased estimators, S hat, well, or theta, yeah, S hat, say, such that the square root of that. is always smaller than 1 over i of s. And for some s, it's really strictly smaller. So in fact, you can have a better precision on s if you are using biased estimator. So why would we focus on unbiased estimator if we can beat that? So because of that, in, uh, in theoretical statistics, first of all, we went to minimax um, measure of how good uh, an estimator is. So the minimax measure is like this. So you are going to take again the square root of s hat minus s to the square. And then you are saying, okay, now I want the worst case scenario. So the maximum over s in my set 
uh, I don't know how I said it, like X. Okay, so in, in my set of stimulus, I want the worst case scenario. So like the worst mistake I can make. And then I'm going to look for the infimum over all the possible estimator. Okay, and in this sense, I will not focus on Stein phenomenon, because for Stein phenomenon, most of the time, you uh, are equal to 1 over the uh, uh, Fisher information. It's just for some s that you can beat it really strictly. So by looking at that, you are looking at the worst mistake you can make, and then you, you can give a rate. So that's the first thing. It's not too <coughs> pessimistic that yeah. you have a large number. Exactly. It's pessimistic, but it means it's a kind of robust measure that you are good whatever the s. Yeah, I know. Yeah, still, we can prove it. I mean, uh, there is a lot of theory in minimax uh, statistics where the whole point is to find <coughs> SAT such that we can reach this lower bound. So there is an SAT which is going to achieve that up to multiplicative constant. And also, usually, here you have a, a set, for instance, of regularity, of nested stuff. And depending on the size of it, you will get different rates. And an estimator which would be adaptive is that whatever the regularity that you put on S, you are going to achieve this minimax rate. So that's basically what people want to do. What? Yeah, I, I agree. But most of the time, the typical behavior and the minimax behavior, they are almost the same. Uh, in most cases, it's not always true, uh, especially because typically the lower bounds that we can prove on that are made usually by Bayesian estimator, which are making a kind of average over all the possibilities. That's how we prove lower bounds. And in this sense, when we have both things, like what is the average behavior and what is the minimax behavior, in most cases, okay? They are the same, and the estimators that achieve that are good for both measures. We do not look at the points where we can really beat, like with Stein phenomenon, that have super efficiency or whatever, which means that there are some points for which the rate can be even faster than that. We don't look at that. But it's at least the average rate or the minimax rate. Um, okay. Um, so just one thing for tomorrow. Um, there is another point of view that we wanted to add with Guilherme, is that usually uh, testing is easier than estimation. It's a bit like your question uh, before, meaning when we were testing, are they all equal versus not, with respect to confidence interval. It's easier and you can detect more if you are making a test. Here is the same thing, we wanted to pose it as, as a test to see in the case where we have the most information that is available, what we can do with that and how we can distinguish here play cell and grid cells. So what we are going to do is to say, OK, we have two stimulus S1 and S2. And now we want to make a test of am I in S1 or am I in S2? So really, I have just two positions and it's one versus the other. Of course, if you are going to estimate them at precision delta n, then you know that if you are using the estimation, as, look, as soon as the distance between S1 and S2 is bigger than the precision of the estimation, you should be able to answer it. But maybe if you really know what are S1 and S2, you're going to find if you are at S1 or S2 sooner than when we are trying to really build an estimate because we can detect it, with, we have more information, we know it's only S1 and S2, so I don't need to be very good at estimating S1 as long as I know that it's different from S2. Okay, so first, it could have smaller. This has been proved in, um, in statistics that estimation rates can be bigger, uh, like different and much slower rates than estimation in some cases. And also we would like to have something which says uh, if we want to discriminate between S1 and S2, then we will have to see the system for, oh, I erased it, for a certain time t. And of course, if S1 and S2 are very far away, maybe I'm able more quickly to make the difference between S1 and S2. 
So I want also to have this part of the answer. And this is what we will see tomorrow, because I think I'm at the end. No? I don't know. How much time do I have? Five minutes. Yeah, so I think uh, I will just stop there. Uh, and if you have questions, uh, tomorrow we will do this testing part. No question? Yeah. Concerning your introductory part right now, uh, is there any way that the auditing helps the equation intervenes with the department? Ah, uh, yeah, well, uh, the, the classic uh, Hodgkin Huxley uh, equation. Um, so, for the ones who don't know, um, uh, it's a differential equation, it's a system of four um, uh, differential equations. Uh, one is really saying more or less what is the shape of the action potential, and the other one are uh, maneuvering the, the opening and closing of channels. Uh, the, the basic Hodgkin is um, is a deterministic system that can be chaotic, depending on, on the regime. And uh, each time it, it, it produces an action potential with a precise shape. It's not just the instance that you have in your equation, it's the whole dynamic of the membrane potential. So what we are doing here is we don't care about the shape of the action potential, we just care about the time at which it's emitted. Uh, we don't care about the opening of the channel. We are putting a kind of random noise, which is the fact that my point here are Poisson, for instance, to, to make it more uh, realistic with respect to all the randomness that is behind. And we are completely neglecting the other part. Uh, after that, um, there is a simplification of hodgkin huxley equation, which is called maurice lecar system, where you have just two SD instead of four. And this one has been proved to have linked with another model, which is called the leaky integrate and fire. And this one kind of looks like uh, the models of Hawks and Poisson, etc. So somehow this one is like the most intricate you can think and is deterministic most of the time. And you can kind of reproduce realistic phenomenon by simplifying the equation and adding more noise. And at the end of this very big chain of simplification, you could end up with a Poisson, which is like the, the level zero of modeling where you don't think at all about the physical system behind. But you can add piece by piece and go back to Hodgkin Huxley if you want it. Uh, except that usually studying typically networks of Hodgkin Huxley is impossible. We are studying networks of Poisson process, and this is, would be the galvas lochardac or Hox processes that Eva will talk about. It's you can do stuff with that. Yeah. But <laughs> in the course, uh, we tried, but uh, so for Poisson, you can make it like having a sequential test. You can compute everything. If we are going to more complex model, yeah, <laughs> it's more intricate to to find out. But this will be maybe part of what's going on next in uh, Sophie PhD thesis. So. We will see. Maybe we can make it. But uh, yeah, we thought about that. But it's much more intricate. Um, for, for the other one, it's a process which is random. And you want to design the stopping time at which you are sure, for instance, that you are in S1 instead of S2. And this would be what we would hope, like the best thing the brain could do, in fact, more than having a fixed time. But I will not speak about that because it's uh, too intricate. Yes. Okay. Well, we continue on with uh, um, our work to work on the
and uh, I, I met someone waiting for me in the, the, the first floor of the building of the, of the Grand South Branch Institute. He said, well, uh, my name is Maud Chun. Uh, may I do you allow me to call your lecture? Of course, of course. And I remember his name, Maud Chun, and I think, I'm not sure about what Maud Chun. And then I, I, I want, I actually, I get some good lesson. I said, some good good. Said, of course. Uh, uh, we have been working on the South for change of significant uh, memory and uh, perfect innovation. And uh, uh, something would happen that every time we put the theorem, two or three months later, more more put the better theorem than <laughs> my theorem. <laughs> So, and now I have how it's also working with this neuroscientific project. But, well, my feeling all the time that I made a mistake accepting it. When, when Claudio asked me to do a long meet of the school in your education, you said, Oh, it's not my problem. But this is a mistake, and it was make a lot of disintegration. I'm not dead. Should accept or not. It's a complicated situation. It's a complicated because you ask people, uh, people are obliged to answer the following question Do, do I have a reason to honor the self? That's not very clear, my friend, not very clear. But I mean, I'm, I'm happy to see here several generations of problems work together, and, and, and I have to have uh, uh, Patrice and Eva. Speaking about the uh, about the math modeling of the neurobiological problems, uh, I guess the method is uh, in neurobiology there are lots of phenomena that people do not understand, and the, the, this phenomena require new mathematics, not old mathematics. Well, the ideas Daniel and I started a lot in long time ago, and so when I met Daniel, uh, it was very Influenced by John Hinsley. John was with us two or three times, I guess. We organized two meetings, John was favored. And we were trying to understand all the idea of statistical model selection. But Daniel knew better than me, so he, he was working with that from that idea for a long time. So we had the idea of using statistical model selection in neurobiology. Uh, and that's why when I discovered that the brain is a statistical brain, but all, was already used by Stanislav Duen mm -hmm. to move the statistician brain, uh, children. But uh, uh, so I, I, I really think that this is the greatest domain of research, not only in statistics, but also in mathematics. Because the class of interacting systems of, or, or systems of System of interactive point process with memory variable length is great. But it's very easy to tell. You see, it. it's very difficult to prove things. But I, I guess uh, the good thing is if I could convince more mathematicians who work on this, because these are great problems. Okay. Thank you very much, Claude, for having the idea. Thank you very much, all of you, for having very impressive.
Pojďte zase, kde? Co pro YouTube? No, I have this one. Just for the Bluetooth. I guess. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, we begin with the with the second course, uh, which will be given by Professor Eva Locherfa, University of Paris. Huh? Paris one. Oh, okay. Thank you, Eva. Yes. Thank you, Miguel. Okay, so this is the, the second lecture, the second type of lecture. So it will be totally on Blackboard, but I wrote something. So I don't think that I will tell on the Blackboard everything which is written in the notes. But I think everything is inside here pretty clear. Maybe there are still some misprints. Uh, yeah. So, and then there will be the exercise sessions that anyhow will help us to clarify things. But before starting to, to give the two lecture, uh, some words, because I will speak about things that I'm working on with Antonio, that we are working on together since, I don't know. I met him, I remember very well, in 2007. It was a Journée de Probabilité, close to Toulon. I also met uh, Sandro at that time, and you gave a talk on which had the title Deux ou Trois Choses que je sais d'elle. I never I thought... I, I didn't understand the title because I'm not mm. very... I mean, I, I didn't watch the movie of Godard. And he gave a wonderful talk on um, uh, chains having memory of variable length. And there will be still some things like that in today's lectures. So we are still working on that. Well, and then this big adventure of working on probabilistic models for systems, biological systems of interacting neurons, we started that later in 2013. Uh, and we are still working on that very much. So I worked a lot with Antonio. I learned most of the things which I found most exciting in my life from him. So I will talk about some things on that, so there will be Kalikov decompositions and, uh, and perfect simulation things in the th third lecture. And uh, also I worked a lot, I mean you sent me your students, which are not students anymore, so Alini and Guillaume. And I will speak about things that, that you did, so you will see a panorama of some of the, the topics that we touched these last years. So maybe I should also advertise, so I mean, I wrote these lecture notes, it's because our common book project is still not, it, it's not published, but there will be a book uh, that we are writing together right now, Antonio, Christoph, and myself on, on, on spiking neural nets, uh, algorithmic aspects, uh, statistics, biological background. Yeah, so when it's there, you will see it, it's a nice project. Okay, um, so there will be four lectures. Today I start very slowly, so I will just introduce, uh, I, I will follow Patricia's lecture, so I will introduce the basic model for, um, uh, for point processes describing big systems, but not infinite systems of, uh, of spiking <coughs> units. So uh, it's a sort of Hox process, but there is this reset, so. Some, some people call that the galvez löcherbach model. Uh, so today I will just focus on defining the model, telling you a little bit on existence properties, uh, on the long time behavior. And then tomorrow I will follow up with a mean field models. That means that we look at big systems of similarly behaving neurons and then pass through limit. In the limit we see some things that we can't find in finite systems, but well, I will touch on on some subjects which are related to metastability. Of course, I will not prove that because there is not the time. And then I will move to the second part of, of, the, <coughs> of the lectures, which is more touching on these uh, simulation aspects. So simulating big systems, maybe even infinite systems. Well, then you only simulate some parts of them, um, first in discrete time and then in continuous time. And all these will be followed in the, in, in the exercise sessions in the afternoons. 
Okay, and for the exercise sessions there, Philippe and Cadmo, Philippe and Cadmo, we and, and, and myself, we will take care of that in the afternoon. Okay. Good. So first of all, so uh, so where should I start? So everything is on blackboard, so you should gather in the middle of the room. Uh, um, maybe I do like Patricia. If I start here, is it okay for the people sitting? Okay. <laughs> no. Uh, here. Okay. And now we make the same test with the. <laughs> Yeah. So if I go up to here. Okay. Good. So continuous time. So first lecture. Ah, this is not the French chart. <laughs> lecture one. Continuous time models for systems of interacting neurons. So, as Patricia said, the two of us we will mostly speak about point process models for, for neurons, so I will represent each neuron by the sequence of successive times where it emits a spike, okay? So, so we have capital N neurons and each neuron is represented by the sequence of its successive spikes. Or I should say spiking times. So the neuron indices A little i for any little i in between 1 and n, I will have, I start counting at time 0, okay, so I have to, to start somewhere, and then I have a first spiking time t1, followed by a second one up to tn. We look at simple point processes, which means that different neurons do not spike at the same time. So these are times in continuous time, okay? So no common spikes at the same time. And I will also use the associated counting process. I write them like that because eventually n, the number of neurons in the system, will tend to infinity in tomorrow's lecture when, when we have lecture when we have mean field limits, okay? So that is the number of spikes of the ith neuron in the system of n, uh, n neurons up to time t. So it's just the sum of the indicators, so n equal 1 up to infinity, that t n i is less or equal to time t. Okay? So in Patricia's lecture, she today only considered point, uh, Poisson processes, which would mean that in that case, this would be a Poisson process of a certain weight. Okay, but in my lecture, we will have a slightly more general model where the weight depends on the membrane potential of the neuron at a given time. Okay. So this is number of spikes of neuron I up to time t. And t is bigger or equal to zero. Okay, 
So in the model we are considering, she mentioned the, the name of leaky integrator and fire models. So each neuron spikes at a rate that depends on its membrane potential at the given time, which I did not define for the moment. Um, this membrane potential collects the inputs of all presynaptic neurons uh, up to that time. And then when the neuron spikes, its own membrane potential goes back to some value, she said, which is strictly below the resting value. And we take that to be equal, that, uh, to, be equal to zero. That is only for simplification. Okay, so, and in between spikes there are leakage effects. That means that the membrane which is separating the inside of the cell and the outside, that is, I mean, there are ions can pass by and that means if nothing else happens, there is some leakage. Okay, so I will write that down. So each neuron spikes. at a rate depending on its membrane potential. This potential, I think it should be an A, huh? collects inputs of presynaptic spikes or neurons, presynaptic neurons, since it's so of the neuron last spike. And then when the neuron spikes its potential goes back to some value that I put equal to zero and we have the leakage. In the model we consider the only randomness that you will see is somewhere hidden there. Okay, so that means that there is a Poissonian procedure. The, the spiking doesn't appear when we hit a threshold because if you, if you want it appears with a certain probability when being uh, sufficiently high in, in the potential. Okay, I will be more precise in a, in a minute. Okay. So, this all leads to what people in probability call a piecewise deterministic Markov <laughs> uh, process model. Okay. We can also have non-Markovian versions, but I thought it's easier for this lecture to have the Markovian one. So it's a piecewise deterministic Markov process model, PDMP, piecewise deterministic Markov process. Piecewise deterministic means in between successive jumps there is a deterministic flow, like a dynamical system. This flow actually only describes this leakage here. Okay? Then the jumping is random after some exponentially distributed waiting times. But the parameter of this exponential distribution depends on the position which it was in time. So it's generalized exponentially distributed random variables. And basically that's all. Okay? So I will write down what is the evolution of the membrane potential that I did not write down on the blackboard for the moment. So I have V, try to stick to my notes, and I of T, that will be the potential value of mu and I at time T. Okay? And um, so, in between successive jumps, we have the leakage 
and this is just at a linear rate, so there is some exponential flow. And the weight is alpha i. Okay. So this is the leakage. So this is only two in-between jumps. And then there is the spiking. So I spikes at weight. So this is the spiking weight function. It's a deterministic function depending on the potential at the given time. So at weight phi i of its potential at time t. I took here the left hand limit because well at the jumping we take well we take cut lock processes so at the jumping time it will be reset to zero so we have to take it just before the jump okay So what does that mean that means that the probability that I spikes in say t T plus H, given the past, your mathematicians know, so I'm allowed to write filtrations here. Yeah. So I write FT is the pass of the whole system of neurons up to time T. So this is then phi I of, of this guy here. Times H plus little of H. So the probability of jumping in a small time interval is the spiking weight applied to the potential times h plus little o of h. I will be a little bit more precise on what that means in a limit and in, in a minute. And if it spikes, we put v and i of t equal to zero. So the spiking neuron goes back to zero. This is the reset. And then the postsynaptic neurons receive something else. So all other neurons, j, will receive what we call the synaptic weight. And this is the W here. So it is I spiking. I is reset to zero, but influences all the other ones, well, all those which are influenced. And they receive something additional, which is the W. Okay. So you see that there is a notion of interaction graph which is hidden here. I'm not speaking about that too much. So influenced are those which have a W which is strictly different of zero. Okay, I could have some of them equal to zero. That just means they are not influenced. They are not postsynaptic to I. Okay. And then you can even do more things. No. So. I think that, well, I'm not a neurophysiologist, but Christoph Pusa told us that W does not depend on the potential height that the spiking neuron has just before spiking, okay? It can depend on other things. So spiking is something very complicated. It depends on the calcium concentration that you have close to the synapse, but that is not the height of the spike, okay? So for you, height of the spike would be yeah, exactly. So here you have the potential, and that would be the height. The height of the spike does not influence on W, okay? So W can depend on other things, but I'm not going to model that, at least not in this lecture. We wrote a paper on synaptic uh, plasticity, so it can depend on calcium concentration, which is close to the synapse, but that is something else.
Ja. Uh, you mean why the, the neurons can have a leakage constant which is different? Yeah. Well, I think that depends on the on the chemical uh, property of the neuron. Um, but I'm not completely sure. You can take them all the same. Okay. But I mean, I take them basically. They can depend on the neuron. I didn't say it. So something fixed. Hmm? On the phi? The phi? The V? The, well, the V is uh, C, uh, C infinity, if you want, in between successive jumps. But then you see at the jump time, it, it goes back to zero. So it's, uh, it's not a continuous. Um, I mean, it will be a stochastic process, which is not continuous. It has jumps. Okay, but in between successive jumps, of course, you have something like e to the minus alpha i t v i of zero, which is c infinity. Okay, but then you break this down, and at the jumping time, it goes back to zero, and then. Okay. I thought you would be asking about this question here, so I didn't say about phi. So phi should be something that tells you what is your probability of spiking when you have already, say, very high potential or something, okay? So it, typically it will be something increasing, of course. The higher your potential value, the more likely you are to spike, okay? From a neurophysiological point of view, it makes sense to take the bounded, which is sometimes nice for mathematicians because then you have a bounded weight, no explosion, but we are not obliged to do that. What we will impose is that it is a Lipschitz continuous function for some reasons that will become obvious later. Okay? So, in. Hmm? No, I'm not able to really. A true threshold function, I'm not able to handle that. So, we can use something like pi i of v, which could be a v divided by k to some very high power. So if p is very high, k is a fixed constant, that would be something like a soft threshold, okay? Uh, if v is positive, say. But uh, a true threshold, yeah, no. But Susanne Dietlesson has published a paper which shows that there is no fixed threshold, actually. So, it's, uh, so, so it doesn't make sense to try to, to model exact fixed thresholds. Okay, so phi is increasing and Lipschitz, globally Lipschitz, we can, good. Good, so this is what Patricia would call the, the geibel löcherbach model. That comes from this simple fact here. The reset of the spiking neuron to something, which I take equal to zero, but you can take any fixed reset, okay? So we have a discontinuity at the spiking time. That also means that the, the neuron's potential is collecting, so it's reset to zero, and then it is exposed to the influence of the other presynaptic neurons, so it's collecting stimuli from the presynaptic neurons since the last spiking times. So there is this variable length memory structure, which is local only for the neuron eye. It depends on everything is collecting since the last spiking time. So you might ask me, is it really only the last spiking time? Well, um, that depends, actually. So, so maybe you have to, to consider up to the second last one. But uh, it seems that it makes really sense from a neuro neurophysiological point of view to, to have this variable length, uh, length memory up to the last or the second last spike. Okay. Um, sometimes I will refer to the Hawks version of this model. This is not exactly a Hawks process, but if I erase this line, so if I don't do anything with the potential of the spiking neuron, I just let it where it is, or even add to this neuron some wi to i, which could be negative, okay, 
then that would be the Hox version. So I write it down because Patricia will use Hox processes and uh, me sometimes I will tell you things in the Hox framework because it's easier because it's continuous. We don't have this abrupt loss of, uh, of potential at this point. Okay. So. So Hawks version would be replace VMI of T equal to zero. So you understand what I mean. T is not any T, it's the spiking time of neuron I. Okay? Uh, I VNI of T is equal to V and i of t minus plus something like that, which we don't need to put, but we can take something negative and then this could be something like refactory period. Okay, good. But in most of the, uh, well, most of the time I will speak about this model here with reset. Okay. So second remark, so I told you this is a, it, it's a Markov process. Well, you see it, the way it's defined it, it's pretty clear that it's Markovian. The true Hawks process is not Markovian. That means that the dependence on all past spiking times, well, you really need to keep in mind all the past spiking times in order to, uh, to describe the, the model, which means that you don't have an exponential flow here. Something more complicated. Follow only one neuron. Yeah. How you have n neurons and you only observe no. one. It's not, not Markovian, of course. How far is Okay. If you take a small speed, how far is it from Markov? Well, I mean, I expect it can be very far. Is it continuous? Your question if it, if it's continuous with respect to its own past, yeah. if I project well, on the past only of one, it would be very similar. <coughs> okay, let's just exercise session. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. So I write down the generator of this process just to be clear what I'm speaking about for those people who prefer that. Okay. So if I write PTN F of V, so V is the collection of the n potentials of the n unit. Okay. <coughs> F is a test function that acts on the n potentials sufficiently regular. And PTN is just the transition semigroup. Okay, so that is the expectation if I start from V of F of V N of T. So VN is the collection of VN1, VN2 up to VNN of the n potentials. Okay. And then If I take the derivative of that with respect to time, so it's Ptn f of v minus f of v divided by t. While it's not so difficult, that what what we wrote in the book, but uh, actually you have to work a little bit to show that we have an explicit formula for that, which is the sum of the two ingredients of the dynamic that we have, the continuous flow, which is just the drift and then the jumping part. So I start with the continuous flow is minus the sum i equal one up to n. It's a minus because the flow is a, has a negative sign. No? So alpha i, v i, I think I had the and then I have the partial derivative of f. Okay. 
So that, that is just the action of the flow in between the successive jumps. And then I have the jump part. I didn't say that, but it was implicitly assumed. In the jump part, I suppose that at a given time, if I know all the potentials, then the decisions of which one of the neurons will spike in the next time steps are independent. Okay. And that is expressed in this sum by saying that the total jumping weight is the sum of the jumping weight. Okay. So each neuron jumps at this weight, and if it's neuron I that is jumping, then I have to replace the total configuration V by a new one, which is delta I of V. So this is after the jump, and I subtract what I have before the jump, which is F of V. So what is delta I of V? This is a vector of the jumping parts in each coordinate. So delta I of V in coordinate J is W I to J. Okay, so it is I is jumping. My question is, what is J feeling? It feels the impact of the synaptic weight. Okay, so this is if J is different of I. And then I have what I call the big jump. So this is the reset to zero of the jumping particle. So it loses everything it has. So it's minus VI because it goes from VI to zero. Any questions so far? Okay, then comes now a short discussion of what these jump weights actually mean. So I will, and I had a definition. Yeah. So I will speak, so I gave that a number, at least in my handwritten lecture notes. So this formula here is 1.1. So now I discuss what actually this means. Because if you look, look at it like this, it's F as if we would have independent Bernoulli experiments. No, if you throw this away, then it means I accept a spike with probability phi of V times H and else I reject. So I will speak now a little bit about acceptance rejection algorithms. So this is the interpretation of the formula 1.1. One. This little law of I H only involves the I neuron, no? Doesn't involve all of them. Yes. Yeah. But it could involve the little law of H to the additional capital. Can you ask your question? So, so what is so it? The law of H. Yes. Only a function of H of I T to V I. So it could be of the whole. This no, this depends on the on the whole um, so the state. So could have some dependence on all the, in the little law of H. Yes. <coughs> I, so what I mean is, if I I condition on the total system at time t. So I, I have... Yeah. Yeah, this only... The, yeah, yeah. Then the question is whether the little law of H could have some other things coming from the state of your... The only... Okay. You see, you could include it very, very subtly, but it could have second order coupling. Mm -hmm. No, but um, yeah, I didn't write it down, so I'm not very precise here. Okay, because it's not explicitly written here that I have independence. So, okay, so in this little O of H is also included that, that all the others don't spike. 
Okay. So I wanted to, to speak about, to be more precise, because I was not so precise yet. So this is, this is more precise somehow than my formula 1.1. Uh, so I wanted to say what exactly 1.1 means. Or in other words, I want to define what, what is a spiking weight or a jumping weight. Okay. So I said it already, they are time varying parameters of exponentially random variables, except that the, the time, I mean, this, this parameter evolves over time and is also random, okay? Um, so, jump weight, or I call it the spiking weight, are time varying and actually random <laughs> parameters of extended or generalized exponentially distributed random variables. Um, Claudio, when did I start this? Just to have an idea. 20 past. Okay. Good. So, to come back to Patricia's talk, the easiest situation is, of course, if phi does not depend on v. Okay. Then it's not time varying. So it's a fixed parameter, and I call it lambda i, like in her lecture. So in that case, it just means that each human fires after exponentially random distributed waiting times. The time parameter is lambda i, and so there are underlying Poisson processes. Okay? So this is easy. So in this case, I will take n and I, and I will always use this notation of T be a Poisson process on the line, so on R plus, of parameter lambda I. I take them independent for the different neurons, okay? And each jump of N and I gives me the spiking time, one of the spiking times of neuron I. So then, we can even draw some nice pictures. Suppose we have nearest neighbor interactions. So something like neuron I only influences neurons I plus one and I minus one, things like that. Then I can draw a picture like that. So here is time. This is time zero. Here are the neurons from one up to up to n. Okay. I start with some initial values of the potentials at time zero, which I should write down there, but don't write them. And then I just have here. Downstairs, I put crosses whenever the Poisson process of the associated neuron jumps. Okay, so suppose this is the first jump of all the neurons. Then we know that at this time, the neuron which started with something initially will forget everything about that. So it's put to zero here. And at the same time, it gives the synaptic weight wi to i plus 1 and wi to i minus 1 to the neighbor neurons. And this synaptic weight is added to the potential value that you have at that time. I don't write it down, but it's clear now. Okay. So then this one starts from zero, so the flow starting from zero it doesn't do anything because it's an exponential flow. And then we wait for the next jump of the system. Maybe if it is this one, then we know that this neuron in turn goes to zero and will add something to neuron i, which is now restarting to live, and so on. Okay? 
So this is what people call a graphical construction, because we can just put on a picture like that. I'm not drawing this picture more than that. You can just put all the jumping times, and then you can fill in the picture, because you have the initial potential values. You can solve the flow in between the jumps, and then make the updates according to the update rule. OK. So that is. That is very easy. Good. Well, in general, it is not interesting to have a Poisson process as a model for the interspike waiting times. Because, well, you can check that in most experimental setups, the waiting times are not independent. <coughs> OK? And you know that in Poisson processes, we have this basic independence. So that's why it's interesting to have the time varying parameters, so a real spiking rate. OK? So now I'm speaking about that. So second point is, is the bounded case, where the phi i's are two functions, but they are bounded. OK, so depend on, on, on V, but they are bounded. OK, so I write lambda i for the supremum norm of phi i. So lambda i will be the maximal spiking rate that I could ever have. OK? So that is the supremum of phi i of v mu now. OK? I didn't say that, but phi is a weight. It has to be a positive function. OK? So, so this would be the maximal weight. And I still take the Poisson processes, the independence one, having the maximal weight. That means that I will create a priori jumps on pictures like that, which are possible spiking times of the neurons, but not necessarily all of them will be true spiking times. And that's why we need some acceptance rejection procedure to decide which of these candidate jumps are accepted. Okay. And to do this accept acceptance rejection procedure, I have to introduce uniform random variables that are just used to perform that. Okay. So I will write T and tilde of i for the successive jumps of the i Poisson process over time, starting from zero, OK? So it's the successive jumps. It's tilde because it's, it will not be the final jumps of my true process Z. And then I add to this a collection of uniform random variables that I just use to decide whether I accept or not these candidate jumps. So this is n bigger than 1. And I do that for each neuron that I have in the system. So for each i in between 1 and capital N. These are iid collection of uniforms in 0, 1. Okay. I will also call them the thinning variables. And then I do the following. As before, I look at the first jump of the total system. So I have 
T1 tilde will be the minimum of all T tilde 1 i, so it's the first candidate jump. Okay? And um, so first of all, you have to decide which one of the neurons will use this candidate jump. It's the first. Candidate jump. So on the event that T1 tilde is, say, T tilde 1 of I0. So it's I0 that would use this candidate jump, which happens with probability lambda I0 divided by the total weight, the sum of the lambdas. We do the following. We accept this jump as a, as a spike. With probability, which is the current spiking weight of I0 at this time, divided by the, the, the upper bound on the weight. So with probability, which is pi I of V, Oh, it's I0 of V N I0 at the time. So T1 tilde, blah, 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 divided by lambda I0. Okay, what does that mean? I accept that with this probability. That means that I throw the first uniform random variable. And if the uniform falls below that value, I accept it and else I reject. Okay. So that means if U one I zero is smaller or equal, I will not copy that. Okay. So if u is smaller than this value, then I accept. Else, if u1 i0 is bigger than the same value, I reject. Okay. And then you iterate. So suppose you have accepted then it means then then I put T1 of I0 equal to T1 tilde and I make my transition according to the transition operator. The transition is this one. That means I put I0 equal to 0 and I add the synaptic rates to all the others. And then I continue. Okay. So I make the jump transition, which would be the delta I0 applied to the current value of the potentials, and then I continue. Is that clear? So I I simulate the second jump of the total system and so on. Okay, so this afternoon in the exercise sessions, you will prove that if I call P1 the first accepted jump of the total system, Then the probability that T1 is bigger than T, which is 1 minus the, uh, the distribution function, is equal to e to the minus sum i equal 1 up to n integral from 0 to T pi i applied to the flow 
of the ith, mu in which is exponential, and that is the weight. And here I have v i zero ds, and I there is no parenthesis. Okay, so it's the sum of the integrated intensities up to twenty which is something like, I mean, an exponential distribution, except that you see that the parameter depends on time. Okay. And here, the initial potentials are deterministic. That's why it's a true probability. And if I would start from some given time and condition on the potentials at that time, then you just have to replace the initial potentials here by the current potential values at the given time. Okay. So how do you prove that? You condition on the total number of jumps of all the Poisson processes up to time t. And then you use that all these jumps have been rejected. And the probabilities of this, you know it, okay, because we well, just calculated. And you use that given that the total number of jumps of a Poisson process on zero t is n, their distribution, so their law in between zero and t, is uniformly distributed. And this uniform distribution gives you this integral from 0 to t ds. Okay, that's the uniform law which is somehow hidden behind. Okay. Good. So that is the bounded case. Any questions? Well, if the Functions are not bounded. I said that we can also consider even the case where phi is something like uh, v to the power 10,000. Okay? So that, that's not very bounded. So if it's not bounded, we can use the same idea, but we have to use um, quantitations. Exactly. So I'm going to speak about that a little bit now. So, the unbounded case. Well, I use the same construction, but I have to update the bounds because I can't use the same bounds all over time because the functions are not bounded. So same construction, but we need to update the bound. So what do I mean? So I start from lambda i, which would be the maximal possible jumping weight if I start from the given potential value at time zero. Okay. So this is the supremum of all phi i of e to the minus alpha t v i zero. That is the initial potential. The flow is just decreasing. It converges to zero. Phi is continuous. So that is bounded. Okay. So that would be the maximal jumping weight up to the first jump of the total system. Okay, so I introduce that for each neuron. They have the associated Poisson processes. You simulate the first jump of the system and you do that up to the first accepted jump. Okay, and the first accepted jump, you add the synaptic weights to the, uh, to the other neurons. That means that you add something to the initial potential values and that you have to update 
these upper bounds. Okay, so we have to update. I got it twice. The lambda i's at each accepted spike or jump of the system. And then you continue. It's clear what I mean? I didn't write the algorithm, it's written in the, in the lecture notes. So there is one obvious problem with this. It could be so I have a first jump. I update my weights. I have a second jump. It could be that at each update of the weights, the new maximal jumping weights of the system are growing as time goes by, which means that we could have something like explosion, that they are going so much that such that in the end we will have more and more jumps, which candidate jumps closer and closer in time. Okay? So people in point process theory call this the problem of explosion. It's not the explosion of deterministic flows, something, something like x dot equal to x squared. It's the explosion in the sense that we have an accumulation of jumps in finite time intervals. Okay? So can we have infinitely many jumps within finite time intervals. <coughs> well, and that is usually something that is handled with a Yapunov type of techniques. So we have to prove that that cannot happen. Okay? And the only condition that we need for that is that the Jumping weights, the phi's, are globally Lipschitz, which means that the power function does not, does not work. You have to work more. Okay. So proposition, if all phi i are globally Lipschitz, then For all t, we have that the sum i equal 1 up to n of the expectation of z and i of t. So remember, the z processes were the counting processes of the accepted jumps. Okay? So this is the true spike counting process of mu and i. And, um, well, they are, only, they are finite even in expectation for any fixed time t which means that we can't have explosion. Can you use it? Um <laughs> I'm pretty sure that you can do a lot of things. Um, so uh, we have the reset to zero of the spiking neuron, and you can use that. So globally Lipschitz is not uh, in general. You're right; it's not necessary. Um, you may need some integrity. Yes. Integrity. Yeah. It certainly mm. needs to be locally integrable. Would that be sufficient for you? So the probability of jumping is zero unless you get a minimum voltage. So don't have cash flow probably. This is very tangible. No, but, but what you are saying doesn't contradict the Lipschitz continuity. You, you just want phi to be zero, and then, then you want to jump, okay. Mm. 
yeah. Yeah, to be honest, all of the things that I'm going to talk about were only in the at least locally Lipschitz case. And uh, I also think that the, the exact threshold does not exist. There, there might be some, I mean, it can be a smooth threshold, but then you have something which is much, <coughs> so you don't have indicator functions. Okay. Okay. All right. So let's keep them Lipschitz for the, for the moment. Um, well, actually, I just need linear growth here. Okay which is less than Lipschitz. So I need that phi i of x is bounded by something plus a constant times x. Okay. I think. So if you have this, then, then I have at least I'm able to construct up to finite time. Okay. So I, uh, if by i is linear growth, so it means that this supremum is only when t is equal to zero. Am I right? Yeah. Yeah. Or oh, you can upper bound it by uh, anyhow, yeah. So I look at t is equal to Yeah, you take phi i of v0, yeah, yeah. Then yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. <coughs> okay. Good. So I just give you the hint of the proof. And, uh, well, that is, of course, something that only works for finite systems. The idea of, of the proof is truncation, actually, as he said. So, so I fix some truncation level, capital K, very high. Okay, higher than the initial values of all the potentials at time zero. Okay. And I do everything up to the first time that any of the potentials exceeds this truncation level, which, by the way, can only be by a jump because the flows are going down. So, such that there exists an i such that v and i of t, I should put absolute values, bigger or equal to, to k, which means that up to time, tau k, which is a stopping time, everything is well defined because all the jumping weights are, are finite. So, up to tau k, we can work with the upper bounds, lambda i, which is the supremum of the phi i of v such that v is less or equal to k. Okay? That would be the maximal weight up to the first time that I exceed it. Good. So I work with this maximal weight and the associated uh, Poisson processes. And then I just write the evolution of any of the potentials up to time t truncated by k. So that is the initial one minus the flow okay, minus the reset. I write minus the big jumps, that means just each time that i spikes, its potential is reset to zero, and this is written here. I will not use that in my upper bound, that's why I'm not going to, to write that explicitly. And then plus the influence of the others. So each time that any of the others is jumping, it gives to i the w, j to i. Um, uh, times, yeah, z and j of t minimum t k. So the total numbers of times that I have received that. Okay.
So I will take absolute values and I will throw away everything which is bringing your system back to zero, which is actually pessimistic. So I'm not using the fact that the flow brings me back to zero, neither that the spiking brings the potential back to zero. And so I get a very pessimistic upper bound on the absolute value of the potential at time t if it's before time tk. This is less or equal than the sum of all the synaptic weights that have been received times the expectation of that. So the expectation of that is, well, that has the weight which is phi of the potential. And you can prove that the expectation of that is just the same thing as the expectation of the integral of the spiking weight of mu on j. I plan to prove that, but we have to do that in the exercise sessions if you never saw that. So this is the formula, which is the same one as for Poisson processes. For Poisson process, expectation of nt is lambda times t. Okay? This is lambda times t, except that lambda depends on time and is random. So it's the integrated spiking weight up to time we are considering. Okay? Good. So I'm before time t, so I will just replace s by s minimum tau k, and I throw this away, and then it's slightly bigger. Okay? And now you see that really the only thing which matters is actually the linear growth. So I use that phi of v is less or equal to a constant times the Lipschitz constant times v. So this is less or equal to, say, C G plus gamma J, which would be the Lipschitz constant, times V and J of S minimum tau K, okay, by my linear growth condition. Okay. And I think I stop my proof here, almost. I will tell you the basic idea. So you see that I get a sort of Cronwall argument, no? that the expectation of vi is bounded by the sum of the expectations of the vj. They are all finite, so I take the sum of all i, it's a finite sum, and I get that the expectation of the sum i equal 1 up to n of the v and i of t minimum the truncation level is upper bounded by a first constant times a second one times the expectation of the integral from 0 to t. And here you have to write the same guy. Okay? Because I will have the sum of all these, these things here. So v and j of s is tk. Yes. Okay. That constant depends on t, actually. Okay. But I'm, say, on fixed time interval. Okay. So by Gronwald, you get that this here that implies that I should give it a name. Um, I call it V calligraphic of T. Okay. So Cronwell gives you that V calligraphic of T is less or equal than C1 e to the C2 times T. Okay. And these constants do not depend on the truncation level. They depend on the time interval we are considering, but not on the truncation level. And that means 
that this is another one that we have on the expected total voltage at any time t on finite time intervals. Okay? And that tells you two things. The first one is that I'm allowed to let the truncation level tend to infinity. You can deduce from that that, so this is the first thing you have to do. The truncation tends to infinity. Tau k tends to the explosion time of the process, but which is actually infinite due to these upper bounds. So this is the first which we can deduce from that. And the second one is then that this upper bound does also hold for the untruncated uh, version of the sum of the, uh, of the potentials. Okay? So this gives me an upper bound on the expected voltage. And since the expected voltage is linked to the expected number of jumps, why? Because I have, I have this formula, the expected number of jumps is upper bounded by something that is related to the integrated voltage. Okay? And so I get the I get the theorem. So maybe it was a little bit quick, but it's um, the standard way of using the Yapunov kind of arguments to get the existence of a process. Okay? And it's not uh, actually the continuity, it's the, the linear growth actually that I, that I used here. Okay. Good. Of course, that works only for finite systems. You can use similar arguments, but I think I have to stop at some point, not in, in 15 minutes. In 10 minutes, OK. So, so I just wanted to tell you that there are nice arguments in the lecture notes that tell you how you can extend these kinds of ideas to infinite systems, where I still use Lyapunov kind of arguments, but I need some strong summability conditions on the interactions, of course. And what I get is not a graphical construction, it's just the existence of the infinite system uh, by some PK iteration argument. Okay? But if the interactions are summable, you can still do these kinds of arguments in an infinite uh, system of interacting nodes. Okay. So this was the first part of today's lecture. Second part will be much faster. 15, yeah, but then. So I wanted to speak about, I wanted to prepare tomorrow's lecture where I want to speak about mean field limits. So I wanted to speak about the long time behavior of the finite system of neurons like this. Okay. And that is a joint work of, um, not of me, but of Alini and Guillermi that I cite, who showed some years ago, I think in 2016, hmm, when you were in L'Aquila, inspired by all your discussions, discussions with Enrico, uh, you show that finite systems of neurons which are behaving in this way and which do not have any outside stimulus that is coming into the system will stop spiking after a finite time. Okay? Which makes sense. I mean, you have a system which is not exposed to some outside stimulus. Well, and then it just will stop doing anything after some, some time. And for this, a long time behavior. And this is actually something which is true. We don't even need the exponential flow. You need some flow. Uh, no, we need the exponential flow. So proposition. So it's Ost. It's written in the notes, say it was in 2016. It's important, it's true. They win. I wrote proposition because of, yeah. Okay, so. Finite isolated 
pistons of neurons stop spiking after a while. Well, the while can be far away, but after a finite. So, should be more precise. What does it mean? Finite is clear. N is finite. Isolated, what does it mean? So, isolated means that if there is no input, then there is no spiking weight. Okay? So, phi i of 0 is 0. Um, and stop spiking, that means if I put ln, which is the supremum of all, I call them Tn of i. So, we call that Tn of i is the nth spike of the ith neuron, the accepted ones. So, of all i less than n and n bigger than 1, that this is finite almost surely. Okay? So there's the last spike of the system, and then the system stops spiking. And if it stops spiking, then there's only the deterministic flow, which attracts every neuron to its equilibrium value, which would be zero in my case. Which would mean that in this case, the only invariant measure of the finite um, neuron system would be the Dirac zero measure. Okay. So that means that Dirac zero, so this is the n-dimensional zero voltage, okay, is the only invariant measure. And I just give you, I mean, it's a beautiful proof. I give you the main idea. So main idea is just to write, okay, what is the probability that already the first spike does never happen, okay? So T1 is the first spike of the total system. So this is e to the minus sum i equal 1 up to n integral from 0 to infinity of pi i of e to the minus alpha i t v i 0 dt. So I integrate the spiking weight of each neuron from 0 to infinity. Good. What does this? Well, you make a simple change of variables. You call this, so this is e to the minus alpha i t, and that is the initial potential. Okay. So I call this y, e to the minus alpha t v, then you have that dy over dt, that is just the flow. The flow is minus alpha i y. Okay? So by doing this change of variables, we have it's e to the minus sum i equal 1 up to n. Then I will have, we will think about the bounds here, I will have pi i of y divided by alpha i y dy, and the flow goes from v to 0. Okay, so from 0 to v i 0. And the fact is now that you see I have pi divided by phi of y divided by y, and this <coughs> integral is finite, if I suppose what I forget to say, what I forgot to say, that phi is differentiable in 0. So, finite isolated systems of neurons stop spiking if phi i prime of zero exists for all i. So, all the spiking weights have to be, to be differentiable in zero. Because if they are, you see that phi of y divided by y behaves like the derivative, and so this is finite. Okay. So, basically, it just means that then the total spiking weight is actually finite for each neuron. And then, by some Borel Cantelli type of arguments, you can show that. So, this tells you each time that the total system is in a compact set, the probability of never spiking again is strictly lower bounded. And then, by Borel Cantelli, at some point it will happen. Okay. Good. So, we. Tomorrow we will interpret this last spiking time like the time an initial stimulus survives in the system. Okay. 
So it's finite, but we will see that in some cases that depends on the parameters of the process, it will be actually very big as a function of capital N, which is the system size. And this is related to metastability. There are some people around here who have worked on that even in the last years, I mean like um, Katmo and um, Morgan. Did I forget other people? No. Oh, mostly. And I also worked on that. <laughs> okay, so we will see that tomorrow. Um, I wanted to say some last thing if I still have three minutes. Do I have three minutes? Because, okay, so tomorrow I will tell you why L is maybe finite but it's very big. Uh, the way I defined it here, you see it's not a stopping time. It's the last spiking time of the system, so that is never a stopping time. But I want to give you a very nice argument that tells you if I use a little uh, other definition of the process, if I take a bigger filtration, then it becomes a stopping time. And that is related to time change arguments that I use also tomorrow. So Ln is, so it's L like last and depending on L. Huh? It's not in stopping time, but we can embed our process in a bigger one. such that Ln becomes a stopping time. Okay. Um, good. And so the bigger process is this one. So I have first the n potential values at each time. So Vn is the collection of the n potentials. And then I add a clock variable to the process that gives you the time until the next spike. And this clock variable is just independent exponentially one distributed waiting times. Okay, so this is now a process which is n plus one dimensional. These are the potentials and E is always positive. And I start at time zero, I start from V n of zero, which is my initial collection of potentials. And E of zero is equal to tau zero, which is an exponentially one distributed waiting time, which tells me actually the time I have to wait until the next spike. And then I use on E just a deterministic <coughs> evolution. So DET is minus sum i equal 1 up to n pi i of v and i of t dt. Okay. So I start from something positive, which is exponentially distributed. Here is tau zero, and then I decrease somehow according to this flow. Okay, the flow is just the sum of the spiking weights of the neurons in the system, and the evolution of the potentials is exactly as before. Okay, so I do that until the first time that this flow hits zero. Okay, so the first time that e my clock variable hits zero, I stop everything. I say that this is my first jump of the system. I call that T1, and I choose a next exponential random variable. Okay. So once E hits zero, I choose a second one, T1. I update the potential values, and I continue. Okay. 
you can prove that if you take the projection of this, pro of this process only on the Vs, that it's exactly the same law as the one that I introduced before. It's a strange way of, of defining a time change. I will speak about that tomorrow, okay? Because actually it tells you that the jumps of the system happen at the jumping time of a Poisson process of grade one, except that you have a speed up which is given by the, by the spiking rate of the total system. Good. Is the construction clear? And if you put it this way, you see that actually the system stops spiking if at a given point we have chosen a weight, uh, a tau, which is bigger than the total integral of the phis. You see what I mean? So in this way, Ln is the first time t, so it will be necessarily a jumping time, um, such that uh, e of t, but e of t is just one instance of these exponential random variables that I write here, such that e of t is strictly bigger than the total integral from 0 to infinity of The sum i equal 1 up to uh, e to the minus alpha i s of v n i of t ds. Okay? So t is a jumping time. I'm at the first jump, but the height that I'm choosing, which is the e of t, is bigger than the total integrated jumping rate of the system if I take V of t as the new initial position of the Vs. Hmm? The firing rate is hidden here. Because here, if you calculate the probability t1 is bigger than t, it's the same thing as saying that the integral of the phi's up to time t is smaller than tau zero. Okay. Yes. Yeah, there is. Thank you, Patricia. There is the phi i missing. Should be the same formula except that, uh, yeah, so it's phi i applied to the total integrated uh, intensity if I start at time t from this new uh, collection of potentials. Okay, and that's the stopping time. And that is something that I learned from Marie Coutrel, which, uh, <laughs> which is a colleague in Paris. Okay, it's nice, no? Uh, and so I will come back to this interpretation tomorrow because this is actually linked to uh, representations of these kinds of processes by time changed uh, Poisson 1 processes. Okay. So tomorrow we will see the mean field limits which explain in some sense why this last spiking time, which is not now a stopping time, will be very large and, and at least if... Um, the spiking activity of the system is sufficiently high compared to the loss of potential which is given by the, by the leakage. Okay. Mais je lui ai posé la question, là, mais elle ne se souvenait plus.
Was too fast or was clear? No. But the, it's a, it's a little bit of the news. Mm -hmm. 